one of the reasons I did this talk is that in my current like day to day, I have to deal with uh, Kubernetes clusters, Linux machines, and in general, like whatever happens in that clusters, in those clusters. So it's a bit difficult sometimes to understand things like uh, we create um, SAS database. So one of the things we need to know is, for example, how many bytes have been written in that file today. And it's an, it turns out that it's not pretty straightforward to do that, these kind of things. So we started exploring uh, a bit about how can you extract those information from the kernel. And it turned out that then at some point we discovered that there's this thing called a BPF. So myself, like I didn't know about the BPF like one, one year and a half ago, but had this opportunity to explore a bit. And so I wrapped up this talk to tell everyone else about it. So ABPF stands for Extended BPF. BPF is basically a Unix feature that lets you um, get some information from the machine you're running on using a syscall. Um, it historically stands for um, Berkeley Packet Filter, so it seems to everyone that is about just networking, but it turns out that it's not actually, uh, at, at least not in Linux machines, because it has been extended to do many more things. In this context, we are talking about BPF as a tracing framework. Uh, this is the use case that was focused on because I wanted to extract the information from my machines, but it turns out that it can actually be used for other things. I will tell um, a bit more about the other things it can be used also so that you know about it, but it's not what I'm showing here. BPF is itself, it's not about like extracting information or uh, doing things basically like instrumenting the kernel, but is something that you can use um, that you can use to instrument other other frameworks that are already in the kernel, right? So, uh, for example, the kernel has some tracing backends that you can use, um, static trace points, key probes, u probes, where you see them. Um, so you basically use the BPFs to access those tracing frameworks. B BPF itself uh, is not the tracing framework, it is the tool that you use to instrument the tracing framework to uh, go to the kernel and use the tracing framework, right? Instead of going there like with um, kernel module or with a syscall, you go there using the BPFs. Mm -hmm. One of those tracing frameworks is, uh, that is posed by the kernel is the static trace points. Static trace points are basically Trace points that are fixed in the kernel that are already there for you to use. Uh, they are defined, uh, if everyone can see, there's this folder where you can see um, by basically uh, printing a file where you can see all the static trace points defined in your machine. And those have been defined by the kernel developers, so they are already there, they have their arguments, their returns, and you can extract information from them. We'll see how after. What's very interesting for everyone on the other end is to be able to define dynamic tracing uh, functionalities. So uh, those can be in the kernel or in your user space programs, uh, namely key probes and new probes. So key probes are, um, is the backend that lets you extract information from the kernel so you don't attach key probes on a binary but you attach key probes on the kernel itself, so your key probe uh, can be attached to a kernel function. For example, if you want to see, as a, the example I made before, how many bytes I've written for a file, you attach a VFS write. VFS write is the function that's basically called in the kernel every time um, a file is written. So every file, everything in Linux is a file, so that's it. And VFS, and VFS read. Um, on the other end, with your probes, you can attach your program's function. So uh, we will see that in a program that I have. It's called Caturday, Show Cats, um, that has a main, fun, a main um, in the main package, it's a Go program. It has um, uh, a variable. It has a function that returns a variable that is an integer, that is the counter of the requests that this program received, and it is in user space, and you can attach to it uh, by attaching a U probe. And then there's XDP. I, it's, this talk is not about XTP, but I want to tell everyone what this is. XTP is Express Data Path, and this uh, framework built on top of a BPF to allow you 
to basically uh, do packet mangling and manage your packets. So you can do like implement things like uh, firewalls, but uh, it tell it it allows you to do more than just like you know. Um, reject the packets in kernel space, you can reject the packets directly in the network card so that you don't even uh, populate the uh, task struct, uh, the socket buffer struct for the uh, packet that gives you a great performance improvement because uh, the kernel didn't even process the packet. So this ABPF thing is all about doing the processing of your information in of them in user space. There's, um, there's a mechanism in the BPF that's called maps. There are a wide set of maps that you can use that basically allows you to aggregate information at kernel level so that you don't overwhelm your user space. Because the kernel can easily deal with like thousands of packets, for example, that you want to analyze, but it's better to not send them all of them in user space if you just want to know the bytes at the packet have been written in 10 seconds. You can do that in kernel space. The life cycle of an eBPF program is uh, quite simple when you have seen it. Um, initially, it seems a bit crazy that you have this situation, but the idea is that you have a program uh, that is written for a specific instruction set, that is the eBPF. Uh, assembly, basically, instruction set that runs on the BPF virtual machine. The BPF virtual machine is implemented in a kernel, and uh, it has a thing called static verifier that is a process in the kernel that basically uh, ensures that you don't kernel panic this machine. So, um, as opposed to like writing a kernel module that, of course, gives you like more opportunities in terms of customization of the kernel, um, an eBPF cannot kernel panic your machine, or uh, in general doesn't allow you to do bad things. And this is both a um, nice thing, but also a bad thing, because sometimes you just want to do things, <laughs> and it doesn't allow you. But it's nice that there's something looking at us. And then the BPF is called there. Uh, so basically, you have this BPF bytecode that you can um, compile with, for example, Clang as a backend that's called BPF. So you Clang emit BPF, and you basically can write a C program that emits uh, a BPF program, and then with the C called BPF, you load the program. All these things seem crazy, <laughs> but there are um, higher level of programs that lets you do things. And then uh, by passing this argument to the BPF syscall, you load the program, the static verifier reads the program, ensure that everything is okay, and then um, the BPF syscall, uh, the BPF VM, understand which pro which, what kind of program this is, a key probe, a U probe, a static trace points, whatever. And if it's the case that the program registers uh, itself to a map, that it's what lets you get the information back in user space. It's basically your communication medium to get out, like, uh, for example, you, like, contract is a thing, right? You could implement contract with this thing, with the BPF. And to get back the information from for your own contract, you will have to use a map that gives you a stream of the, the connection that has been opened. And the mustache part of there says that the BPF program are not Turing complete. So basically, you cannot, you cannot do loops. So that's because of the static verifier doesn't allow you to do that. But uh, if your loop is, for example, like to, um, like you have a list of server, or a list of IPs for your, your uh, network interface that you have to control these kind of things, if it's a fixed uh, loop that you have to do, like it has a set of elements you already know at compile time, you can now roll the loop with a pragma call in your compiler, for example. Or you can just write down 10 times the thing. And what about today? I mean, um, seeing that this thing is pretty crazy, some of you know this. I started doing this talk one year ago, and well, maybe it's because it's, here it's false then. So 
The people that come here are more like on the edge of this kind of thing, especially for the Linux kernel. But in general, no one knows what are the applications today. One of the most common is TCP dump. Uh, who uses here TCP dump or used it? Everyone, uh, basically. Not you over there, but I see you. TCP dump is a um, program that lets you basically dumps out, it dumps out the packets that you're receiving in this machine or in a specific network interface you're pointing to. The TCP uh, dump program that I'm using here basically gets all the IP packets and um, the IPv4 and TCP and on port 80, so this could be HTTP traffic. And if you pass the D parameter to TCP dump, it dumps out the BPF program that it's loading to do that. So TCP dump actually uses uh, BPF program even if you didn't really uh, see them. So BPF are a mainstream thing now. Uh, even if maybe you are not yet like implementing them in your programs, they are, they are a thing for everyone. And the things that dumps out here is uh, the instruction set uh, that it's you, the, the portion of the instruction set that this is using. And if you look at it, it's basically like a reflection of uh, the RFC implementation, right? So these two instructions mean, is this an Ethernet TPv4 packet? I don't do this thing like uh, automatically, so like if I will not have written this here, I will not know. But I did uh, the math at home and wrote these things out. And uh, is SRC X plus 14 on port 80, so um, 15 uh, hexadecimal, and same thing for destination. So uh, since I didn't specify here SRC 80 and destination 80, this is assu assuming that it's always 80, and uh, it's basically adding two instructions both for source and both for destination. Who uses Kubernetes, containers, Docker, whatever? Raise your hands. One of the main, um, one of the main, the main, uh, basically, um, isolation, uh, isolation technique that uh, container runtime uses to basically allow you to share your kernel between your container and the host machine is seccomp. A seccomp, uh, what does seccomp do? Basically, like if you go to the Docker repo, you will see, it's a Mobi actually repo now, you will see that it has a predefined seccomp set of rules that basically doesn't allow you to capsize admin so you don't become a network administrator, these kind of things. And it turns out that SecComp has an eBPF subsystem that you can use to define your own like rules as compared to like because SecComp lets you like just define rules, say block this is called, block this is called, block this is called. But it turns out that with the BPF subsystem you can actually like write your own rules. Uh, if process ID is odd, <laughs> block the syscall, right? These kind of things. Uh, probably the use case I just told it's probably a bit silly, but <laughs> It's something you can do. And in this situation, I just compiled this program here. And the program I did is printing gator, and then, oh, and then it is uh, installing a filter with this function I defined here. Uh, as you can see, I'm basically writing, uh, using a DSL to write the BPF assembly here. You, are not need, you don't really need to do that. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. Yeah, it, it took to me so much to <laughs> end up with that thing. But um, it turns out that, like, I, I could have written this in C and compiled with Clang and copied it here. And it's basically the process that I used. But I really want to be very cool and write there the assembly. So that was it. And <laughs> then, um, basically, I load that... Um, I load that BPF program in second with those instructions. And this filter is installed uh, in the NR write, so I'm blocking all the writes to everything and on this architecture, and I give back uh, an EPIRM when you try to write. So everything I'm going to write after 
this uh, second registration is going to be denied. So I just started that program I made with Astrace, just to see. And uh, the first call went OK, and all the others just gave a pair and exited the program. What are more practical examples? Um, trace file open by file name. Uh, I, I've written a bunch of them. Uh, go runtime events uh, for XDP firewalls and packet rewriting. Trace commands and in a bash shell. Write a keylogger, whatever you want to write. One of the use cases I use a lot is, since our phone Influx, uh, trace query done against a database. Like, I don't do the core of InfluxDB, so I don't really know where to, uh, I, I don't really want to mangle with their code <laughs> uh, because the core engineers don't allow me, but um, I don't really want to do that. Um, so I just load an eBPF program to see what's happening. Yes, it's crazy, and, and no one's wants really to do all of that. This statement is probably to another conference, and not at FOSNAM, so higher level APIs are not for FOSNAM people, but let's see them anyway. An interesting project is um, iVisor Go BPF. Uh, if you are a Go programmer, um, you might want to just uh, load your uh, BPF program using Go, actually. A Go BPF is uh, basically a binding that lets you load uh, BPF programs uh, and compile them and load them. So you just provide the C program as I did here, like I use to read file, bash read line C. I will go to that program in a second. Or you can give Go BPF the program already compiled. The difference is that if you uh, ask Go BPF to compile the program, in the target machine you will need to have uh, the compiler, basically, while if you give the program already compiled, you just have a simple Go binary in the target machine. But the real innovation in this um, repo is that it allows you to um, register to the maps that I told you about before uh, using Go channels. So you can actually read the maps in a concurrent way. Um, Let's go very fast through this program. I just read this uh, bash read line C here. What is this doing? Is that it's basically doing some verification that are required for the static verifier to let the program work. And then I get the current process ID. I register it in this event that I created here that is coming from this struct that is also registered in my Go program. So I have to maintain, when I send the data with the map, I have to maintain the struct bot in uh, the BPF program and in my Go program. And then I registered this uh, BPF per FATU map. That BPF per output is the um, map that you want to use when you want to have a generic map to send things. Like if you don't want to use a specific one, this one is generic and it's always registered and works very well for like debugging use cases. So BPF per output here and this is the same real line events here and real line events in this, in this case here. Uh, so I register to this table and every time, um, every time the function read line is called on bash, I send an event. So this thing is basically, you start a bash shell everywhere in the machine, uh, and every time, read line is the function in bash that's called whenever a um, command is issued. So when you write a command in bash, read line receives it, read line is a function, so you're getting the argument of the function, and you send it to, a, to the map, and the map receives, is received in Go here, in this table, and then this table has a channel, and this is connected to the table, and then you just, uh, get the information out of one channel using a for loop here. Um, and then you print them basically out. So if I load this program in a, in, a, in a Linux machine, what happens is that I just see all the bash command issues. Another interesting project always in IOVisor is BPF trace. 
BPF Trace is an higher level language that has been written for the purpose of doing BPF tracing. And it's a bit easier because you don't have to deal with all of this. Um, this is still very good because it's very um, extensible, like you can write your, basically your own Go program and inter having it interact with the BPF program. But if you just need uh, some specialized tool, like just, ex just extract all the write, maybe you don't need like, to do anything else with them, you just want to see them, it's easier to use BPF trace. Um, I'm always talking about this IO visor because it's the Linux Foundation BPF project. It's basically um, right now the main contributor to BPF. Other contributors that are very notable are um, me, I'm <laughs> joking, and <laughs> are Cilium that is basically doing, they are doing their SDN for Kubernetes, but they, are, they basically wrote the documentation for a BPF. Like if you write the BPF documentation in uh, DuckDuckGo, whatever search engine you use, I will not, um, you basically find uh, them. Um, or, well, that's what I found actually. Uh, I didn't find anything, uh, other documentation else. Um, and other contributors are the guys at Kimball, we have one of them there. Um, and all the others. I will tell them about that later. Um, but IOVisor is the main contributor, actually. And Brendan Gregg, uh, that is uh, working on Netflix doing performance, uh, created this um, graph here showing you all the interaction points with the BPF using BPF trace. So you can easily see that I was always talking about VF VFS. Uh, so if you're interested in the file system, you can go as down as you want, down to the device drivers. Same thing for socket, same thing for the scheduler, for virtual memory. You can interact with the syscalls, you can interact with the system libraries, up to the applications. Um, and you can connect to all of these things using the uh, trace backend I said. Trace points, hardware, profile interval, um, K-probe, U-probe, USDT. USDT is very interesting. I didn't add those in the slides because I uh, didn't want to, keep, to make this all very long. But um, it basically allows you to define uh, static trace points in your programs. One of the most notable projects that uses this is Node.js. Node.js already has uh, USDT is defined so that, for example, you can get all the arguments to Node, node functions using USDTs, because a node program will, it's not like compiled to an object. So how do I do these kind of things with uh, an interpreter language using USDT? And what about Kubernetes? Yeah, finally. <laughs> um, turns out that there's not really anything for Kubernetes. There are a bunch of projects around, um, but not a lot of projects that are like uh, in a group that actively maintains them in a way that they are using used uh, very uh, broadly in the community. Uh, we, uh, my friend Leonardo there, we had an idea to use BPF trace against Kubernetes clusters, and we create this plugin called kubectl trace. Then Brendan Grant noticed it, and we contributed that to. IOVisor basically. So now it's IOVisor QCTL trace. Uh, I will have a demo shortly. Uh, there's a little disclaimer. Uh, this is not my laptop. <laughs> That's very funny. I left my laptop at home, so this is Leonardo's laptop. So if you see Leonardo around, it's not my fault. And if it doesn't work, it's Leonardo's fault. So uh, yes, of course, you can uh, all punch Leonardo in the face later. And uh, so you can find uh, QCTL trace in IOVisor. Uh, the philosophy behind BPF trace and QCTL trace is that they are Unix tools uh, following the Unix philosophy. So you just run them, uh, see the results, and they're gone. Uh, it's not a kind of tool that you can use like to let your program run there forever or uh, that you can look to other things. You just, hey, I want to see all the file written, and I want to see all the connections. You see them, and they're gone. 
uh, the usage is kubectl trace run, BPF trace program, and then since we are in Kubernetes, your node or your pod. So you can attach a program to a pod specifically or to a node, uh, and then you just attach a TTI every day. An interesting use case, uh, it's seeing, for example, um, the distribution of read in a file. Um, like, you're reading a file, right? But you never know uh, how you're reading it, right? Um, it's a question that the first time I, I asked myself this question is, what do you mean with the how I read it, right? I just read it. Right? You don't just read a file, you can read it in different ways. You can read it in chunks of like one gigabyte or in chunk of one, two kilobytes, right? And that gives you different performances. So like if you're writing a database like we do, and you're reading or writing files a lot, this is a very huge difference. Like uh, if you write a uh, cache to a file in chunk of one gigabyte or of one kilobyte. And this tool gives you an insight of that, BBF trace, and by extension, QCTL trace on clusters. And since with QCL trace or BPF trace, you can define your own output format, you can like write CSV, and then you can pipe it. As I said, it follows the Unix philosophy. So you can pipe it to, um, to another program like VZData that lets you plot your results in a different way than uh, QCTL trace does. So QCTL, BPF trace has functions to aggregate your um, results like histograms. You can see the maps as sums, these kind of things. But if you want to aggregate them yourself, you can do that in user space. And there's a demo time. Leo, you think it will work? Who knows? Um, so. I try to do my best to be comfortable with this machine. Um, so I have this Kubernetes application called Caturday that shows cats. Seems fine. And basically, it's a deployment with, with three containers and runs this Caturday thing that uh, has an HTTP server that shows you cats in the browser and cats in the terminal uh, with a row endpoint. So I'll just run it. And I see my cats. One of them are already running. I see that there's a service where you can reach cats, and it's over there. Then I have to use bash because you think that'd be crazy. And This Caturday program is, is, is implemented in this main Go file. And yes, it has cats. And what I'm interested in is getting out the value of this counter value. Counter value is called, we will see in the cats now, <laughs> it's called every time uh, someone calls an uh, endpoint or shows cats. Uh, if, if it's uh, uh, for the normal endpoint or for the row endpoint, so basically we see one, two, three times. It's an atomic counter showing how many times the cats are being showed up. And I just want to be able to extract that information without uh, having like, uh, well, you can monitor this like adding a Prometheus endpoint or adding an influx client and send information out or log to a file and send them somewhere, or you can extract information using any BPF. And that's what I want to do, so I have the cats here, I have a pod. And what I want to do is this one liner here. So it's big enough. And I want to do QCTL trace run, U red probe, uh, U probe doesn't give you the return value of the function. Your red probe gives you the return value. Key probe and key red probe, same thing. So I attach this red probe to my 
I don't really know where the binary is in the container, so I just use its process ID and get the binary from Excel. And I want to print the counter, uh, and I will get the value from this main counter value. And the pod is this one. So, um, what's the pod there? One of them. Maybe this one. And I just use it here. And I start this thing. When I it started, I can do crystal trace get. Oh, export. Or maybe it's better to start it here. Okay. I didn't have the environment variable for Kubernetes. And okay. It started and saying, hey, I'm waiting for you to send a control C because control C, uh, that signal is used to uh, tell the program to dump out the maps in BPF trace. And so I can do trace get. Oh my, not my keyboard. In the name space. So the experience is very similar to the normal QCTL uh, programs. And I say that I have this QCTL trace here. And I see that it's attached. Now, I just want to like do a curl to those to that cat same point that is in the network namespace. And okay, this is the HTML endpoint, and I just want the row and oh, the row endpoint. So you see that I have this counter with three cats here showing four, five, and I have this number here too. So Every time I call the cat, it gives me gives me the counter increasing in from the BPF extracted from my BPF trace program started from my laptop and the cluster might be anywhere. So it's a very good helper to extract information this way. And other one liners I prepared for these are um, This one, same node. Uh, in, this ca in this case, in a node, they want to see how many times the C center wildcard syscall has been called, um, and I'm creating here a map called probe. At and uh, parentheses is create a map, and the com function lets you see uh, how many times this center has been called. And same thing, I will wait for it to run. I didn't do that here. Okay, cool. Touch. Attaching 300 probes because C center is called a lot. And then I just plot the results. So C center, C center socket 435 times in one second. Right? But another interesting one is counting BFS writes. So this is what I said before. Every time a file is written in the Linux kernel, it goes through the BFS. BFS write um, here, I, I just, well, this is not C. I can import uh, Linux others in BPF trace using the same notation. I can create struct in, using the same notation so that it's easier for one to uh, start informations. But um, so I extracted the uh, file information from the uh, file descriptor and then I create a map that, it, that has file name and the sum of bytes that have been written. Uh, 
on this, this knob, and they attach. And then I just go to the internet and do some things, just because it creates some, well, this Kubernetes cluster is running on this machine, and this machine is under, um, is under control, so, and this is not my GitHub because it's Leonardo's GitHub. And I just control C here, and I say, I see that there's some stuff running. I see that TCPv6, because the false internet is in IPv6, so it's not TCP. And I see that Firefox is doing a lot of things with SQLite and everything. And another interesting thing is seeing the same thing with an histogram. So let's still go around, open category, whatever, and control C. In this case, I'm seeing not just the file, the bytes written, but also the distribution of the bytes written per chunk. So like uh, for this cookie SQLite, well, I see that it's between 16 and 32 bytes, or between 32 and 64 kilobytes. While if I go to TCP, it becomes extremely clear, clear that the TCP RFC has been implemented correctly because it ranges from 16 bytes to uh, 8 kilobytes, right? So if you're implementing your own TCP, you can debug that with this. Who, who doesn't do that? And turns out the resources for a BPF uh, are starting to pop out from the internet, but there's not really yet a book for it. So. David Calavera and Jesse are writing one. And this book is coming out from a really some, sometimes this year or next year. I don't know. It's not, yet public, it's not public yet. But the book is coming. And uh, as I said, there's, there, are, there, are, there have been contributions from my advisor, uh, Cilium, and other entities. Uh, Linux security models use this BPF thing. And there's a slide with references for you, so if you want to take a photo and check the references for yourself. And it's everything. Uh, I bought a nice domain, it's called BPFSH. Nice. If anyone wants an alias, just um, write me an email, I will be happy to give it to you. Um, just because this community wants to have more people looking at the BPF and having a nice email put you in a situation so that you have to do that because you have the email address, right? <laughs> I'm joking. And if there are any questions. Uh, thank you for the It's shut down. You want to use mine? No bot rate. Um, I think I can do it with boards. Uh, uh, do you have any questions? You would have to speak up, I'm sorry. Uh, unfortunately, the microphone is uh, dead. Uh, you would have to repeat the question <laughs> yeah. for, the, for the recording. If I understand it. So, my question is, I think when you do I don't hear it. Uh, so, yeah. Should I come to the front? You, want, you, want, you can call me if you want. I don't mind sharing my my thing here. Uh, if, the, if, you have, the question is, if you have, uh, if you're on good control, is it possible to connect? Uh, I don't hear you. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, in other words. Uh, 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 probably I have no working years, uh, but it's not working. Tell me. Well, you know the question right now. <laughs> so my question is, uh, when, oh, nice. you're on, uh, when you're on kube control uh, trace, uh, you target a node, right? Well, is it also possible to filter for specific containers or for specific pods? For example? Oh, yeah, I did that in the demo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. sorry. Now we have Maybe it wasn't clear. Uh, I can show you that. Yeah. Um, uh, so the question was, it's possible to target a specific pod with QCTR trace. Yes, it is. Um, like in this case here, um, I was using pod slash 
name of the pod instead of what is happening no, instead no. of the node. Um, it turns out that this support is not very well done yet because we have to do some changes to BPF trace to support feed namespaces. It kind of works, but there are works to make it better. And there's actually support for C group V2 in uh, BPF trace that you can use with QCTL trace. Uh, but C group V2 are not the default in Kubernetes. So uh, I didn't make an example just because it's not. Uh, Alban there is doing the talk uh, this afternoon that shows the C group support very well. Um, so. So yeah, we found a microphone. Um, nice. Uh, do you hear me? I told you myself that way. Anyway, uh, any other question? Oh, yeah. Please be kind. Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Really nice. Um, I'm really interested in this, uh, but I'm also scared. Is there any chance I can shoot myself in the foot? Um, I want to test this on a server, and then I do something stupid. I run out of bandwidth, out of CPU or something, and I cannot connect to the box anymore. Is it possible um, for me to... It is possible with BPF in general. Uh, like, for example, well, uh, the only use case that happened to me that I basically um, locked out myself of the machine has been with XDP because it was mangled with packets, so I just basically um, dropped all the packets and my SSH packets too. Uh, like the same thing you do with, I, with IP tables. And um, that happens, or like that you uh, create a loop with packets, continue going to the same interface, and you basically lock yourself out. Um, but uh, BPF programs are not persistent in that way. You have to load them again. So you just restart the machine. And with BPF trace, it doesn't allow you to do this kind of thing. So um, not with BPF trace, but with BPF in general. Yes. Um. Uh, next question. Oh, we have two. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I think the m very, very useful tools for my uh, mostly Kubernetes administrator, so I will use some of your uh, tips. Uh, but uh, my question is, have you uh, used uh, Sysdic, uh, or, and could you compare your, this solution with Sysdic? Well, yes, I use Sysdic too. Um, but Sysdic runs as a kernel kind of module. And uh, that's one of the things I want to avoid personally. My machine likes to run certain models for monitoring. Uh, so I was starting exploring this thing. I think that Sysdic does very well the presentation of the data they extract. Uh, but I think that those data can be extracted also with an EBPF program. So like, it would be cool if there was an EBPF tool uh, that extracts the same information as Sysdic. This microphone is driving me crazy. And, um, but that has a nice interface. Uh, that's what we mean. It's like, uh, that's the same reason I did this, because I just wanted to have something that just let me do stuff like without having to SSH in all my machines and uh, run the program. It's also because I don't really know whether things are running with Kubernetes. So, yes, I like this. Sort of a sort of microphone interference. We have a question. question over here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, SecComp uh, is still using classic BPF, uh, not eBPF. Yeah, it is. Do, do, you know, do you know if and when the eBPF support will be extended to SecComp? Um, it's a tough question. I, <laughs> I've been reading uh, recently uh, on the LKML that it's arriving. Uh, I don't think it's coming this year. Uh, so honestly, I don't think that's any progress. Um, that's like measurable in a way that you can say, hey, in June it's arriving. But uh, that's, all, that's all I know. I'm not involved in that, so. Um, any further question? Okay. Thanks for the question. Oh. And thanks for qualifying that's classic BPF. BPF. So can you aggregate data from, a cr from around the cluster, or do you need to target a specific node or a specific container? Nice question. <laughs> um, 
uh, not yet because BPL trace with QCTL trace, right? You're asking, or uh, with QCTL trace, not yet because BPL trace has been created specifically for single nodes, um, so you cannot. Um, but it can be done. Well, we are working on that. Like we are working on like having BPL trace um, expose a different format to aggregate from multiple nodes, but not yet. Um, but that's in my personal plans, at least, um, because I'm probably doing that. If anyone wants to contribute that, I would be super happy. But uh, it's mostly in BPF trace, because QCL trace just runs that. I can run the program in multiple machines, so it will work right now with streams, but it doesn't work with aggregation, because aggregations are, are basically done in uh, that machine directly. Thanks for the question. Hi, uh, thanks Hello. for a nice presentation. Uh, more of a general BPF, eBPF question, but also maybe can be applied to Kubernetes as well. Is, um, how safe is it to run a tracing uh, a program on a high load production server to do real analysis of what's happening? Is it going to affect performance? And if yes, is there any numbers of what you can expect? Of course, it's really probably difficult to answer depending on what the program is doing. But yes, yeah. The question is, how safe um, is it, and can you actually run this in production to see how it how it works? Thanks for the question. It's a thing that I missed saying the thought. Uh, so thanks for the question. Um, what you usually do to know what your program are doing in general is like you use a debugger or you use S trace, these kind of tools. Uh, those tools actually um, put interrupts or dwarf symbols or whatever in your program, so they need to interact with your program in a way, while BPF doesn't. BPF goes to the kernel, the kernel receives uh, all the information from the program already, and you just attach yourself uh, on a side and get the information the kernel already has. So the, the performance is impact is not, it, it's always not in uh, the program itself, it's more in the kernel because the kernel needs to process your code, but it's very, um, it's very low. Like, you will not, you will never, uh, well, you can do that, but you will never attach like S trace in PID1, right? While you can do that safely with an MEPF program. Okay. Thanks for the question. That was the thing that I missed to say. We have another question over here. Uh, any other question? Some questions. Um, okay. Um, then thanks for the talk. Um, Thank you.